So welcome everybody. Uh, this is the first talk on the second track, and this talk is titled uh, OpenSUSE Packaging is Macro the Way to Go. So first of all, let's start with the uh, right foot. Let's uh, have a big chameleon for the first talk. And um, I am Danilo Spinella. I've been software engineer in packaging for almost three years at SUSE, and I've been maintaining LibreOffice, MyDB, and a couple of compression packages, including XZ which I make, uh, still make some people trigger. What are we going to talk today? So today we are going to see a couple of packages, two packages. One is a C program, the other is a Python program. And we are going to compare the RPM uh, spec file with a couple of, di of other distribution approaches. Afterwards, we are going to see the differences and we're also going to see the caveats of all the various approaches, including the caveats of using macros. At the end, we're also going to see if there is any room for improvements, both for um, our OpenSUSE, for packaging in general. So let's start. I'm not an RPM developer, unfortunately. I'm a RPM packager. So if there is anything that uh, I'm going to say wrong about RPM, please keep your fork with you until the end of the talk. <laughs> Let's start right away. Let's take our RPM spec file. I hope that uh, you can read it even from the back. This is uh, a really simple C package. It's called MDP, which is not to be confused with uh, MPD. Um, this is the simple C program that I can think of. It's, uh, it uses make to build. Uh, it literally only has a binary and a main page. And it's also the package that is currently being used in the Packaging for Beginners conference wiki. Uh, I didn't know which package to pick for that, so I, I picked this one. And I picked this one for this uh, example as well. As we can see, we have the metadata at the start, we have uh, the value section, and uh, in each section we call macros, we call make build, make install. Uh, we have the file section, which is something really specific to RPM. We aren't, we aren't going to see any other file section during this presentation because no other distribution does, uh, does have that. And this is pretty standard uh, RPM. So how we can summarize the RPM we have just so? We can say that, uh, at least in my opinion, we can call RPM spec just a collection of metadata, comments, and macros. And if we take a step back, we can even say that package is just, just a collection of metadata, sources, comments, and patches. At the end, all distribution just that the same thing, just in a different way. We use a little bit different commands. We use different patches. Uh, for example, Alpine Linux has a lot of patches for muscle. We have patches, uh, we are SUSE patches. They are different from many other distributions, and so on. Which distributions are we going to see today? So first of all, we are going to see Arch Linux. Let's see, let's do a round of hands up. How many people have heard of Arch Linux or used it in the past? Well, that's a lot of people. <laughs> it's quite a fairly common distribution. I'm not going to trust the same for Exerbo because I know that. Uh, oh, there is somebody who knows Exerbo. OK, that is really good and expected. So I've been, uh, before joining SUSE, I've been packaging at, for Exerbo in my free time for a couple of years. So this is why I picked it. Uh, it's the, uh, the other distribution I know a lot about how it works. And it's also a really good example. It's a source-based distribution, so it doesn't ship binaries. This is another approach, and uh, it highlights something different that we cannot do because we ship binary, we have a completely different approach. The last one is Void Linux. Let's see how many people know is, knows Void Linux. OK, that's still uh, really good. Void Linux is a not so common distribution. It also ships uh, uh, binary packages, and it has a similar approach to Arch Linux, but in some way, it is really, really uh, straightforward, and the packaging is uh, streamlined. We are going to see what I'm going to refer now. So let's dive into it. This is a package build. This is the core of our Arch Linux package. And uh, other than this, there are just patches. So all the information for building an Arch Linux package is right here. We can see that this is a bash script. And all the metadata are just uh, bash variables. We can see the version, the dependencies, which is just in courses. And then all the different sections are encapsulated inside bash functions. So when we build the package, we are going to call the build uh, bash function. 
and we could make directly. There is no macro, no helper script, no helper function. We just call make. And we do the same for installing. Inside the package function, we call make, install, and we put the, all the entire arguments, which is, in this case are just prefix and sdr. We are basically copy-pasting the entire commas. And we do that for all the packages. Arch Linux doesn't have any helper script, which is a, basically like a brute force approach. It's completely different than what we saw before with OpenSUSE package. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Just a real random uh, technical question. Are these license and uh, depends variables uh, bash arrays? Uh, do you mean uh, if they are bash variables? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're, these are bash script. These are all bash variables, uh, bash arrays, and so on. And this is also the uh, original uh, package build for this package. If you go to Arch Linux uh, uh, repository for packages, you're going to find the exact same package. We are, we are going to see all, uh, our source code that we are going to see today is taken as it is from uh, uh, the various repositories. So let's see now something completely different. This is still a bash script. This is the Excelable package, which funnily enough, uh, I've written in back in 2019. And we still use this bash variables for metadata. You can see the summary, licenses, uh, dependencies. Dependencies is a little bit uh, weirder. You can see build uh, plus run. We're basically defining the dependencies for build time and runtime all together. Uh, you can see that we are not calling make anywhere. This is the, the first thing that we, uh, we are seeing. There is no version here. And also, we don't see any source code. We don't see the tarball mentioned anywhere. So let's start with the line four. Line four, you can see require GitHub. GitHub is an XLib. It's a basically a collection of functions that uh, the Excelbro package uh, uses. And in this case, we are basically telling the package that we need to download the source code from GitHub. The user is the one that you can see. And the name of the package is the same as the name of the as uh, the name of uh, the name of the repository is the same as the name of the package. It is automatically going to download the source code with the version. We cannot see the version here. Where is the version? The version is inside the file name, which may seem a little bit uh, weird. When we need uh, more version, we need to have multiple files. And the other thing that uh, I really want to um, put, uh, put emphasis on is the um, absence of make comments here. So by default, uh, just like uh, package build, Excelbro package have various phases. We have the um, prepare phase where we call configure, we have the compile phase we call make, the install phase, the testing phase, just like the different sections in an RPM spec file. We have the default ones, we are, which are basically the one that calls make if there is a, a make file. And since this package is basically calling make all the time, we don't need to redefine them. We just need to fix the prefix here, you can see. And then we call the default src prepare. Uh, let's see now the last example that we have for this package. This is a template for void Linux. And this is just metadata. We don't have anything else. In this case, there is also the default functions, which are defined for packages uh, for C packages that uses uh, makefile. And at line five, you can see that uh, we are calling build style GNU makefile. We're saying that this package builds using makefile. We don't need to do anything else because calling make and make style with the right arguments is enough for, for us. This is very, very streamlined. It's very similar to package build, but it's also uh, very minimal. And the difference is that they have the build style, which is really, really powerful. We are going to see another example of build, file, of build style later. Let's go back. Let's dive in what we saw right now and see what's behind the hood. So right now, we have the various macros that we saw, make build, make install. And basically, they call other macros. We never call make directly. We call the macro for make, which make it more flexible. And uh, we do the same for make install. Macro basically is a, um, a, section, a section of text which gets expanded by RPM when, before it gets built. It also 
it is recursive. So we, are, we can define macros that uses other macros. So we need also need to be careful to not have a recursive macro uh, indefinitely, because that is going to have a stack overflow. Let's see the approach from Exarbo. This is the default functions. Every time we don't define the functions for an Exarbo package, these functions are going to get called. As you can see, we check if there is a make file, a uh, new make file, and then we call make. Emake is just an output script uh, uh, on top of make. And we do the same for installing it. There are a lot of different params that we can add. We don't need to redefine the functions. We just need to add the params. And this is really simple, at least to use for a packager, not to write. I need to put a lot of effort into making this uh, configurable from outside. And this is the GNU make file build style. So the build style for GNU make is just basically um, 50 line uh, script. This is just the do build because the other part were not relevant. So I didn't uh, paste them here. And as you can see, we just call make with the arguments. We define all the different arguments that uh, defines the build, and then we call make. The same goes for make install. I just didn't paste it here. So we saw different approaches. We saw package build, which is uh, almost like brute force calling of commands. A lot of repetition. If make ever changes his invocation, that we need to change the entire packages, which is uh, a lot of work. If make changes invocation, we can just update the macros for OpenSUSE. We can update the default functions for Exerbo. We can just update the builds, the build style, the GNU make file build style for void. So these, uh, the approaches try to avoid repetition. They do it a completely different way. But this is uh, just a simple C program. So let's go to something more complex. Let's go to a Python program. And let's see how they fix the same problem. So I'm going to start with the package build. It's just uh, calling Python commands by, um, by themselves. So I think that's the best example to start. As you can see, this is a card. This is a Python package for um, having the calendar in the console. And as you can see, it has uh, just a couple of dependencies. We define the dependencies, the dependencies for build time, runtime, and check time. And um, this is the rest of the package build we call Python directly. We call Python build, we build a wheel, and um, we also build the documentation, we call PyTest, and we call Python installer. This is a brute force approach, a lot of repetition. If you if you think that all Python packages are made like this, uh, just think about how much repetition Arch Linux does have. Let's see what we do in OpenSUSE. This is the same package that we have uh, at OpenSUSE. And uh, we define the dependencies as well. We use Python module because we don't know here for which Python version we're building. So by using the uh, macro Python module, we are going to require the, the uh, correct version of the module. Uh, I think that here there are a lot of Python experts uh, which knows more about how this works for me. But we are going to just see this as a packager. Um, let's go into the rest of the spec file. We are calling the, all the Python macros. This is for a Py project uh, wheel, is the new thing. And as you can see, we are not calling Python by itself ever. This, is, this allows us to avoid Repetition, this allows us to update the macros when we need it, to put the uh, correct arguments, the optimization arguments, the, comp com uh, the compilation arguments as well. This is really, really powerful. At least in my opinion, this allows us to have uh, uh, really streamlined packages. Let's see the other approaches. This is uh, an Excelbo, this is the Excelbo package, which uh, also is one that I was maintaining back, uh, uh, back in 2019. And, uh, there is a lot to unpack here. Let's, uh, let's go uh, and see step by step what is here. So first of all, we have require PyPy and set, uh, set up Py. In this case, we are not downloading the source code from GitHub. We are using PyPy, which is the Python index. And then with set up uh, Py, we are basically defining how to build this package. So we are saying uh, we are using the setup tools. We don't want to use this to deal. This is made for compatibility reasons, because this setup file 
library was written back in the day when these two tiles was still the default. We say that this package has a binary, so we also disable the multi-build. Xerbo is a source-based distribution, so we can build all the packages for multiple Python versions. We build the packages on our own machine. So this Python, uh, this Python package as a binary, we don't want the same binary in three different Python versions. We just want one binary made with the version that we prefer, let's say Python 3.10. And we never want to build this, py this Python package with uh, Python 2. Because, well, Python 2 is, uh, is it was too old in 2019, uh, is uh, really old now. We defined the various dependencies. Again, we use build plus run, because these dependencies are both build time and run time. And we never call Python here as well. When we define setup pi, when we require, require this library, the default function for this library, which includes compile, install, will be directly imported inside this uh, Excelbo package. For the test, we need to copy um, the configuration file for card. So we copy it, then we, we say setup pi src test, call the default function for our Python package. And this is also another approach. We don't use any macros here, but we still have a repetition. We still allow packagers to not do any copy-paste, which we really don't like copy-paste. And let's see what uh, Void Linux template does. Again, in this case, the important line is the line 5. We say this is a Python 3 module, so we want uh, to build using the Python 3 module functions. We never call Python here anywhere. We just add a um, function to install the configuration file, the completions, and so on. But this way, this package builds with Python 3. We create, we build the Python, we test it, and we also define the arguments for testing it. We say that we need to uh, skip a test because it was fading. We can also see the different ways that they have to be flexible when packaging. We don't want to define the entire function just to skip a test. So let, let's go over to the caveats. Why these uh, approaches have some disadvantages, some drawbacks. So first of all, this is the make install macros. It's still in um, the macros installed on our systems, but it's still uh, there because it was used back in the day. I don't know when it was used, um, but it's still kept, kept for compatibility reasons. And this is how we do. We can with macros, we can either update the macro itself or we add a new macro. And this is what we did with uh, make install. The make install comma that we saw before, at make lower dash install. This is make install without any lower dash. This is a completely different macros. We don't use that anymore, but by adding a new macro, we can we cap this one and we avoided updating all the packages at once. We updated uh, step by step in a proper manner. What Xerbo did, um, at, one, at one point, they saw that the Python, the setup Python library that they were using required an update. They added new functions, but they didn't want to break compatibility. What did they do? They basically added uh, an Xlib API version, which by default is two. When we required the, the library, just what uh, we did before, we added some arguments, import, setup, uh, setup tools, blacklist uh, two, if we use any of that uh, um, arguments that belongs to the old version, then we are going to say, look, we are still using the old API, so don't use the new API. This is kept for compatibility reason. And you can see, there is, this is really the, the code that there is in uh, the setup file. If you, if you look at the code, you can see that uh, this is exactly how they solve the problem. And um, depending on the Python Xlib API, the version that we are using, we are going to call different functions. Of course, this means also that uh, we are going to have repetition. We have uh, same functions that does a little bit different things defined two times. So this is something that is not the most practical approach, but it still works, is what they used. Um, another drawback of what we saw before of uh, uh, the Xerbo approach in this case, this is a um, Android package that has uh, both the bash completion and the GSH, GSH completion as well. 
we have two different libraries, Bash Compression and ZSH Compression as well. Both these libraries, they installed all the compression that they can find by default. They define an install function, and when we call it, they, they get the job done. But we define these two different libraries, so we have two different install sections. Which one should be called? This is a, an issue that we have. So how do we fix it? We basically call them manually. So as you can see, as you can see, this is the install function we define for this package. And then we call the bash compression src install and the zsh compression src install by ourselves. We don't use the default importing of the uh, install function because it doesn't work. We have two different install functions. We need to do that in order to, for them to work. This is the issue. If we uh, import different libraries that defines the same section, like install section in this case, we need to define the, the section ourselves and call them manually. Otherwise, they don't work. This is the issue with uh, this approach. And this is a really simple uh, package. Think if you have a package that uh, is way more complex, it requires different building. For example, it's a, Python, it's a package that requires CMake that also has a Python library. Then we need to call CMake library uh, from here. We need to call Python. And this gets really, really complex easily. Uh, now I want to see, uh, I want to talk uh, about uh, another issue. All that we saw right now uh, were bash script. Even the spec file, we have uh, bash script inside the spec file in the different sections. This is the code that I taken from LibreOffice.spec file. Uh, we have the other <laughs> LibreOffice, LibreOffice maintainer here. <laughs> um, so we want to have a list of files. <laughs> uh, hi, Martin. <laughs> So what, we don't, what do we want to do here? We basically want to have all the files that correspond to that glob inside a bash variable. So we have a string, and uh, for all the different files, we add them to a string. If it was any other programming language, and somebody did that, I think that uh, they would be fired on the spot. <laughs> but somehow in bash, this is the default way that we do. This is still uh, in the LibreOffice spec file. And then for each of the file, we add it to the file list. So that then later on, we in the file section, we just import this file. Uh, let's say that we want to update this part. We want to have something better. We can have something better. We can have this one. We can just uh, uh, use bash arrays and use the globe. When we do that, basically, we are going to populate the files variable with uh, all the files that correspond to the globe. Then we do the same. We don't update the, the last part. Does this work? Uh, does anybody think that this work? Let's, let's do a round of uh, ends up. OK, nobody thinks that uh, this uh, work. Why doesn't it work? I mean, it's the same code as before. Here's the, the problem. When we do the, the thing that we did before, just the first elements of the array will be iterated, and all the others will be lost. So it is, this is a really a uh, big issue because if we don't know what is the issue, then it will get really long time to debug it. And it happened uh, back when I was using a server. Uh, I had this issue many, many times. What, we don't, what do we want to do here is to call the right way of a bash array to expand it inside for all the uh, elements that we have. So when we do it like that, instead of just the first element of the array, we are going to have the entire elements, but we are still putting it inside a uh, uh, a string. So we are still using strings. This is, the, this is the bash way of doing things. Now this works. Now this works. So other caveats that we can think of. We saw different build styles, but if you think how many packages and different ways of building, we have CMake, Mason, AutoTools, uh, Configure. There are so many different ways of building a package. So by the time that we're using macros, we're using Xlibs, we are using build styles, the number of files that we need to maintain, or different styles that we need to maintain, grows exponentially. We can have a Python free, a Py project, we can have a Ruby, Cargo. The number grows exponentially, so maintaining them takes a lot of time. The other problem is also that 90% of the application is just basically the collection of metadata, and it remains the same across all distributions. As you, as you saw, uh, for the package that we had, MP, MDP, for example, is uh, almost the same 
for Void, Arch Linux, OpenSUSE, etc. It was the same package. Of course, we have some packages that we build differently, especially build packages, um, big packages. But for small packages, Python packages, Rust packages, the build is, is exactly the same. The metadata is exactly the same. We are just doing repetitions between across all different distributions. So let's see, let's see if there is any room for improvements. OilShell is a new shell which uh, tries to fix the problem that we have with Bash. Bash, uh, Bash um, scripting with Bash is not really that comfortable. Uh, there are a lot of issues. The one that we saw before actually happens a lot of time. And we also have uh, variables. When we do a mistake on the variable name, then we get nothing, and we don't know why the code doesn't work. OilShell is um, a shell script that basically allows to have better way of defining variables. It does a check every time you use a variable. If the variable doesn't exist, it's going to stop there. We also have a better way to handle arrays, better way of trying our programs to see the error to catch if a program exits successfully or not. It does so many things that will make a scripting, especially for packages, a lot way better. The other approach is to have tools which uh, tries to avoid repetition. For example, we saw for the package build of the um, card Python program, we saw that there were a lot of Vistal commands. For example, by using um, a tool which avoids calling Vistal all the time, we can avoid repetition and improve the packages for all the distributions. This is a tool that uh, I've uh, been working for the last years and also I'll be presenting it tomorrow uh, in the morning here. And uh, the, last one, the last thing I want to talk about, there are also other approaches that we didn't see today. One of them is, is NixOS, which is uh, another way of packaging, because this is a declarative language. They developed that just for NixOS. It works in a completely different way. Even the configuration are put in, in a declarative way, which is uh, really different from uh, any other distribution. I don't know too much about NixOS, so this is why I didn't show it to you today. But this is also another approach that we can consider, we can study, and we can learn from. Uh, also, the other thing that we can consider is uh, having uh, um, a format to include all the metadata of a package that is agnostic to any distribution. So we can have the same format. And then, for example, the package build can be created from this format. The OpenSUSE file can be created from this format. The template for void can be created from this format. In this way, we would avoid a lot of repetition. We work together with all the different distributions. This could also be a possibility. So thank you for your attention. Is there any question? Stand up, please. Well, yeah. 15 years, ago, I've, I've been 15 years ago, I have been trying the same. I, I didn't uh, finish uh, the, the implementation, but um, but I have some um, something that maybe you can re recycle. One of this is smart globbing and splitting sub-packages. Sub sub and the second, uh, I, I, uh, I created a patch for glibc open uh, that checks for, uh, for, for potential build requires. That is really, really interesting. Uh, I really love to uh, talk this forward with you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, you're welcome. Is there any other question? Um, so, um, I'm the new LibreOffice maintainer, if you have any questions. <laughs> uh, no, just <laughs> 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 a disclaimer there, but I just wanted to ask, uh, RPM has a really useful thing where we can expand the macros ahead of, of trying it, right? So we can see how it's going to work a bit before you're trying to, to build it. Do, do the other tools have anything like, like that? Like this, uh, can you see the context in which a bash function is going to execute? Can you see all the context around it? Uh, this is a really good question. So first of all, I'm also going to say that we can expand macros, but if the macros depend on the, cont of the context of the build, in that case, it's a little bit dif difficult. So it is also something that is hard to do at OpenSUSE. I'm not aware of any other way of doing it in uh, um, Arch Linux or Void, so I don't think there is any way to do that. That would be also really interesting to see the result, uh, the result script, but um, uh, it, there is not currently, uh, as I'm aware. Thank you for the question. Is uh, there? There. Yeah. 
Um, I wanted to ask you, Dario, if you're aware of this. There, is, there would been a blog post um, um, last uh, this month. Uh, uh, the, the website is called uh, Rachel by the Bay, and she was uh, 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 sys administrator. And um, you, Dario, have uh, described the, the situation with packaging. Uh, she was bringing uh, a, a, um, an issue that is a lower level with uh, with auto tools, so configure, make, etc. And she was saying. You know what? Every time we we build uh, um, we build software on a machine, we do this configure dance where we try. Uh, does this support that library? Does it support that library? Does it support the library, and then you build the uh, uh, your, uh, your your executable. Then you run configure for the next time you want to I install something, and again all the same checks, which of course are going to have the same outcome as the the time prior, but. Um, at the packaging level, maybe you don't have access to a solution for this problem. Like this is uh, the other tool is something that it's uh, let's say upstream of the packaging work. There is no. Uh, the question is: uh, Do you think the, uh, in the packaging space there is uh, the opportunity to address this uh, uh, verification that uh, what what supports on a system instead of running it like multiple times? Uh, this is a really good question as well. I, I think that. Um, there is no way to do that without the support for build systems. So for example, I'm going to take a, a, another build system as an, ex, as an example. If we got Mason, which is also a C build system, we got Mason to speed out all the different dependencies, maybe we can parse them and uh, do something like that without compiling it multiple times. But speaking of other tools, I think that they will be pretty complex. It's a really uh, old build system, so I think it will be hard to uh, implement something there. We can also parse uh, the auto tools file manually, but there will also be a lot of work to do. So there is a lot of improvements to uh, have dependencies uh, defined by upstream to get them to the packagers. Somehow, a lot of times, packagers need to get the dependencies themselves, which is not a good thing to do a lot of times, especially with auto tools. Uh, there is a lot of improvements there. Uh, I agree. Uh, you talked about the auto shell. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, do you think that it is a good idea to create a new uh, programming language for uh, writing uh, these uh, uh, scripts when you could use some existing programming language like uh, Python or Ruby that is like general purpose but can also be used for writing your build scripts because then you can reuse knowledge and libraries uh, uh, for the existing languages? Absolutely. This is a really good question, and it's also something covered by OIL. So I'm going to, to big, mix both my opinion and the one that uh, are from the OIL shell author. So I, I think that programming languages that are general have a lot, good of, uh, a lot of things that are good, but somehow they're not made to build scripts, especially when you think of output redirection or checking command exit status. This is something you can do in Python or in Rust, but it takes a lot of time and effort. It's way easier to just run a command and check the exit status in, uh, in Bash or in OIL, because they are made for that. So while, uh, yes, it is complex to write a new programming language, I think that the benefits are worth the effort. And uh, um, I'm, there is the OIL shell packaging, uh, the OIL shell documentation, which explains this way better than I am right now. So I, I'm going to share it with you afterwards. But uh, um, do you do you want to? Uh... Uh, yes, uh, in Python you have libraries that uh, make uh, calling external programs and checking the result and uh, taking the output easy. Not as easy as in the shell, but fairly easy. And the other thing is that because Python is a powerful programming language, for many things that for which you would call an external program uh, in a shell, because the shell is limited, you can do that in Python directly. And it re reduces the number of additional tools that you need because the language is powerful enough to do it for you out of the box. Uh, this is also a good point. I think that the answer is somewhere in between because we need to have small scripts that don't call a lot of things outside, but we also need a good scripting language. And uh, while there are libraries for Lua, I also tried the, the Lua um, library for doing that, just like Python. 
they have a lot of drawbacks. But uh, I'm looking forward to discuss this with you afterwards. There are a lot of good points there. Uh, Matei? Just a variant on the previous question. Okay, so no, not Python, and I can, I'm Python maintainer, I can see many reasons why one not to ha wants to have a Python in the, for example, in the host system of the micro OS or something like that. But why not to use another non-POSIX POSIX, uh, POSIX uh, shell? There are plenty of them, fish, or well, I don't know. Uh, because I think that all the shells that are available right now, they all have uh, drawbacks that makes them a uh, little bit uh, suboptimal for scripting. Uh, the script fish shell is really good for interactive use. I use that as my shell. But for programming, uh, it's not as good. At least uh, I, I used the uh, fish programming in the past. I had a, a small Telegram bot. Uh, written in fish, but uh, it's not really straightforward. It's a little bit counterintuitive. And I think uh, OSHL is uh, uh, fixing a lot of those issues. It still has a lot of way to go, but it's a good idea, and I think that uh, we really need to look into good ideas. So, so um, I'm back here. <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, so is oil shell backwards compatible with Bash so that we're not having to rewrite all of our RPM specs? <laughs> Uh, this is uh, uh, also another interesting thing. Oil the shell author made uh, oil shell backward compatible. So you can run a bash script. It will also do a static check on the bash script. So it will also tell you a couple of errors of, uh, on the bash script. And uh, you can uh, start using your bash scripts and slowly moving forward to oil, or just use oil as a bash uh, shell. You can also do that. So they, the author thought about this. They, they knew that if they just wrote a new shell um, with no compatibility to Bash, it would be really, really hard to move into. So the author just uh, did that. Uh, thank you for the question. I just wanted to mention that there are also a comment that there are also other projects called, or there's a project called Spark, and that's packaging for high performance computing where you can build your complete tool chain from the compiler to the end application with all the libraries, with all the optimizations on, and it's also, yeah, implemented in Python, but that's another way of packaging. This is also really interesting, I, uh, I really want to, uh, to know more about that, it would be interesting. Uh, so a few people said, why don't we have something like Python in the shell? And uh, the answer is there is actually a shell that does that. Uh, it's called Exxon. It's technically POSIX compatible from what I understand. Uh, and you can put Python in the middle of your bash script and it'll execute it. So uh, I tried the Exxon in the, in the past, uh, but I didn't really quite like it. It was a, just a matter of personal preference. It's a really good project and people put a lot of effort on that. But I didn't really quite like the results of the script that you had. But it's, a, it's an effort in that, so all efforts are appreciated. Um, I think that because of the backwards compatibility of oil shell with Bash, it cannot be a good programming language. The, the, thing, <laughs> is, uh, the thing is that uh, the most uh, problematic thing I see in Bash is that it doesn't have separate namespace for data and for identifiers. It's all mixed together, one text soup, and it's interpreted like depending on position or whatever. Whereas in uh, Python, you can tell if a thing is a variable name or a string because you have to quote the string every time. And that's really powerful for understanding uh, the, the script for maintenance, for tooling, and it just doesn't exist in shell and never will. And that's the problem with it. I, I think that is also a good point because uh, the, um, the context when we run a bash script is uh, something that we have a lot of issues. Um, the oil auto added uh, functions that, for example, you can have functions just like Python. They add a lot of Python ideas into our shell. So they try to, um, to fill the gap. But I, I, I really like the result. And I think that we can look into Python, but currently there is a lot of gap between Python and a shell, uh, even with the libraries. Uh, this is my personal opinion, at least. Awesome. 
last question. I was just going to say that it looks like we need a couple of beers and a long discussion about this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for attending, for attending, and let's have a couple of beers. <laughs>